Can anyone out there please tell me what it is that Netflix is doing? Because for the life of me, I, I cannot figure it out. I really can't. Hello, my friends. Sakuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. As you can probably guess from the title of this video and the images that you've seen, today we are going to be talking about the upcoming Netflix docudrama series that they are creating on Alexander the Great, Alexander, the Making of a God. Now I say upcoming because I'm sure that at the time that this episode releases, the series itself is already out, but at the time that I'm doing this, it is not, and my kitchen is currently flooded from a pipe that has exploded inside of my house, which means that I'm going to be occupied for the next week working on that. So that's fun for me. So I know that I'm going to be behind, but if you want to support me, I'm not asking for money or anything like that, but if you want to like, comment, and subscribe and do anything you can to help my videos in the algorithm, that is something that I do greatly appreciate. But anyway, enough of my troubles. Alexander the Great, that's what you all are here for. I'm sure that many of you who are watching this right now remember many months ago when it is that I went and reviewed Netflix's Cleopatra as well as Njinga, the series that Netflix was putting out about African queens of of which I think that there was supposed to be more, but the sheer amount of backlash that these things received for what it is that they put out, well, I mean, I, I think it's understandable as to why no more have been created since then. But while nothing has been created for more African queens, simultaneously, Netflix is still continuing down the path of creating docudramas. And all of that brings us to the latest historical creation of Netflix, Alexander the Great, The Making of a God, which is a docudrama. Now, I have not seen the trailer. I have not seen anything with this. What it is that we are going to be doing right here is going through and effectively doing a live reaction and pointing out all the things in it that I think are positive and things that I think are negative. Like from the very beginning here, I know that the show has not even played. The trailer has not even started. It is the very beginning and already I am seeing some pretty severe armor issues. Oh my God, bracers. Why does every single historical production seem to want to utilize bracers even for forces that didn't really have them? Anyway, I digress. Before it is that we even continue with watching this trailer, there's something that I want to point out that this is my issue with what it is that we have seen from Netflix so far and what it is that they are creating. What we are talking about here is not documentary, is not anything like that. I specifically use the word docudrama because that is what best describes what it is that Netflix has been creating. A docudrama is neither a documentary nor is it a drama. A docudrama is, as the name implies, what happens when you combine a documentary with a drama. It is something where you are not only trying to educate someone on a topic, but tell it in such a entertaining way where you are creating and crafting a story around it that you are presenting. Something where we are not going to just talk about the specific events that happened, but also create dialogue, create things that fill the gap that show the story actually playing out versus saying this happened, then this, then that, you will actually show the dialogue or rather make up dialogue to insert between to connect the aspects of the story. The problem with docudramas, as we previously discussed with Netflix, is that when you have an organization that seems to have a kind of social or political bias in things, when you try to create a drama that inserts aspects that really are not historical, not accurate, and in some cases quite politically insidious, then you have a tendency to lose your reputation. It's going to lose your audience. It's going to piss people off, which, I mean, from what you can see here with the Cleopatra trailer behind me, is exactly what happened at this time. And now the latest example of this is Alexander the Great, who is easily one of the most iconic historical figures in, well, all of history. That all being said, what you can see here immediately from the trailer is that this one hasn't been nearly as negatively received as any of the other ones that we have talked about, from Cleopatra, and Jinga, etc. So perhaps there is actually some hope with this, as the audience is appearing to be a little bit more receptive. Will it be good, though? Will it be bad? To what degree would it be either of those things? How accurate is it? Well, my friends, let's go ahead and dive in here and see what we're actually working with. Is this what you expected as a secret? Well, probably not, but hey, welcome to the behind the scenes. I know that the majority of people who watch my videos are men, and I can tell you this right now, if there is one thing that every man knows, it is that people used to have amazing and glorious beards. What happened to us? People just straight up do not take care of their facial hair anymore. They just, they, they outright don't. It's like when you see people at political rallies talk about wanting to go back to the good old days, and you think like, good old days? Yeah, the good old days. Like the good old days where men were men. Actually, now that I say that, there's, there's probably many more ways that that could be interpreted, and that is, uh, that is probably not a good thing considering history. But you know what? Luckily, I did figure out how to be a man in the modern day and age. By getting manscaped. This stuff is absolutely beautiful. We got like beard shampoo, some beard oil, I got a beard comb, and even a beard brush. And this right here is the Beard Hedger Pro that ties it all together. Which honestly, and I'm not even just saying this for an ad, this is genuinely the best razor I've ever owned. This knocks anything I've ever gotten out of the drugstore like out of the water, hands down. 
Well, either way, what I need you to do is go to manscaped.com slash history of everything today, and you will get 20% off plus free international shipping if you use code history of everything. That is manscaped.com slash history of everything with code history of everything, and you will get 20% off plus free international shipping, and you better do it or else. The cat gets it. Now, I hope for the love of God that none of this actually gets flagged by Netflix. So for that purpose, I am going to be stopping every couple seconds or so in order to be able to talk about what it is that we are seeing. And hopefully that goes and appeases the YouTube gods. First off, we're going to start here from the very beginning by saying that this right here is the depiction that they have of Alexander the Great, which I'm going to say this right now from the armor, from everything you can see here in the background. W why is this so incredibly drab? Why is it boring? Why is it dull? Everything that you can see depicted in here is some kind of grayish brown, which yes, it looks like legitimate armor. And in comparison to a lot of historical works, this actually is somewhat better looking armor than most, but it's still not necessarily accurate for the Macedonian period that we're talking about here. The closest and most accurate representation that we have of what Alexander the Great actually looked like is from a mosaic that was from Pompeii back in like the first century. This being something that is believed to be a copy of a Hellenistic work earlier. The beautiful thing about mosaics is that in comparison to carvings and statues and things like that, of which yes, we have an absolute ton of statues that depict Alexander the Great. In fact, he was one of the most commonly, I, I don't even know what the word would be in this scenario, I guess depicted individuals for any kind of statue across the ancient world. Back in the day, these statues would have been colored in, so we would have been able to see what it is that he looks like. Unfortunately, paint doesn't really last the test of time in those circumstances for what would go on a statue, but mosaics add a degree of color and actually let us see that the armor was very brightly painted and depicted. This was the case for a lot of ancient armor in which it was all about being able to stand out. Macedonian armor itself was actually quite colorful. This is something that when you talk about Alexander the Great and his companion cavalry, it was all about making a striking entrance, both in the sense of visually and in the actual sense of striking an opponent very hard and very fast. There is absolutely no sense of color whatsoever to any of this. Literally, the most color that you can actually see in here is from the crest of the helm, which I'll actually say this from the beginning. They did a fairly decent job when it came to helmets in this, at least what I can see from the start. By the time of Alexander the Great's conquest, they were using a different kind of helm than what they previously had done. I'm pulling it up on Wikipedia right now, but what you can see here is that the type of helmet that they typically would have been using prior to Alexander the Great, and this was still used by a number of infantry, was the Phrygian helmet that you can see here, of which there are a number of different variants. And then by the time that Alexander the Great came into existence, the type of helmet that the cavalry was utilizing was this, the, uh, the Boeotian helmet. And so while Alexander could have a big and important and famous crest, and this would be the style that he would be going for, it seems that for the cavalry around, at least from what I can see here, they just went and tried to recreate Alexander's helmet just without a fancy crest and just slapped that on there. Maybe for production values, you know, I don't, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to recreate any of the others. And then the next thing that we're going to point out, and a number of people are probably going to question, is the armor that is actually underneath the main cuirass that is here, which the cuirass itself is something that looks like it almost could be leather. I mean, this could could be metal, it could be leather, it really just depends on how it is that they're trying to depict it here because the colors are again so drab that it's hard to actually point out what that could be. But this padded cloth-like structure that is under the armor of Alexander, this gambeson-like thing, that is something that, to be fair, we actually could give credit and say that that is possible. You do not typically have just a solid suit of armor on top of anything. The padding or whatever was underneath really is up to artistic license for what it is that you're going to represent because anyone who is worth their salt is going to make sure that over the course of a long day of battle, they are not going to be chafing. So you're going to want to actually have some layered protection that is underneath your main suit of armor. Still though, this, th this, this does not look like Alexander the Great's armor. I brought it up in the first place when talking about the mosaic, but the armor that was being utilized by the Macedonians by this time was was Linothorax, which for anyone who doesn't recognize what that is, and in this case, Alexander the Great has additional protection that was sewn into his, at least from what it is that we could possibly guess or see. This is more of what it is that I am talking about. Linothorax, as the name implies, is multiple layers of linen. It is fabric that has been laminated effectively and compressed to a degree that it is light, but still provides protection against blows. It was the armor that most of ancient Greece had by the time of Alexander the Great's conquest actually switched over to in comparison to the previous heavier armor that could have been used by Hoplites. In this case, people think of the classic Greek armor of the solid bronze cuirass. 
One of the key reasons that the Macedonians had actually switched over to this type of armor by that time was that it was significantly lighter. The Macedonians had reduced the weight of their armor in order to add to the power of their equipment as well as their speed, because the weapons that they were utilizing were these massive sarissas, which, as you can see from the image behind me here, was a polearm that was something along the lines of 5 meters long and weighing up to 12 pounds. It was something that truly was massive. It required two hands to be able to hold and utilize, which meant that you needed a smaller shield and lighter armor so that you could actually move faster and hold it without exhausting the individual soldier. This though, this is just drab. It looks like medieval fantasy battle armor, like not something that you would actually have for a representation of history, but something that would be created for some kind of generic fantasy show, if you will. And bracers. Oh my god, the bracers. The freaking bracers. From what it is that we understand, bracers are not something that actually would have been utilized by the Macedonian army because that is just additional weight that is being attached to your arm. And when you are holding a polearm outwards like this for the entire time, the additional weight that you would have on your body is going to weigh you down. The whole point of Alexander, the whole point of the reforms that they put into the Macedonian armory, armory, ar ar army, 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 but I guess it also is the armory, was to make everything as light as possible. But okay, I've talked too much. Let's, let's continue. Let's see what it is that they're actually saying, because otherwise I'm going to be here literally all day talking about this. A war is coming. Yes, it is, I guess. Wait, so hold up. Fierce. No. Oh, no, no, we are quite literally just like four or five seconds into this, and I am already seeing some problems. All right, from the beginning, let's let's go back into this. I'm going to try and pause this on the individual scenes that I recognize there from the very beginning. So we have a oh, battle that is breaking out from the start here. Okay, okay, okay. Battle scene, immediately seeing this. Um... What is with the leather armor that is already being depicted? What what is this? What is with the like turbans that I, I that's got to be the Persians that they're trying to represent here? The Persians didn't utilize headwear that looked like this. Like what is even going on with that? Leather like armor over tunics? That okay, that doesn't really make much sense with this. What is this helmet that we are seeing on this side? That that isn't even something that represents the Phrygian helmet. That's literally just a bucket that someone slapped onto a guy and cut ear holes out of. The opening scene of combat is also people smashing around in a melee. Thank you, Hollywood. Thank you for giving us that rather than actual representations of battle tactics from the beginning. I love seeing that. Can you hear the sarcasm in my voice? And the spears are pointed up while the actual combat shot is people swinging swords at each other. Love it. L love, love it. I'm guessing from the very beginning when it is showing this that this is supposed to be King Darius. This is going to be the great rival of Alexander the Great, the ruler of the Persians. I don't really have much to say about this, but we'll see where things play out. So let's go ahead and play the trailer here for a little bit and see what actually shows. So fierce. So apocalyptic. It will split the world in two. Oh. Whoa, okay, uh, hold up, hold up. From the very get-go, I'm guessing here, considering that we're seeing a stabbing that is occurring right there, that is, that's gotta be the assassination of Philip. Okay, so for those of you who are not aware of what happened in history, Alexander the Great became king of Macedon at an exceptionally young age. We're talking only 20 years old, and a lot of people think that the conquest of Alexander the Great, that he is the one that really developed the Macedonian army, that he is the one that turns it into the insane fighting force, but historically, and I know that this is probably not something that will necessarily go over here unless they talk about it in the docudrama itself, but Philip, his father, that is the individual that actually created Macedon as a state. He is the one who completely reformed its army and turned it into the fighting machine that it would become. Alexander is the guy that just led it afterwards and was exceptionally good at doing so. But yeah, Philip gets assassinated and that is how Alexander becomes the ruler. Our king, my father. Bracers! Frickin' bracers! Why not? Why, why, why not, Netflix? Just, just keep on putting it in and we will call it out every single time. Also, this is the first time that we're seeing in the trailer a depiction of Alexander the Great without his helmet or any of the stuff on. And this is rather interesting. It's keeping his hair a lot shorter than what the majority of depictions would have of him, which technically speaking, you could say that the longer hair that we typically associate with Alexander the Great could be something that is a sign of, you know, he's been on campaign for many years away from a barber, and that's why his hair is longer, etc. Whereas in the very beginning, his hair is uh, uh, quite short, but also at the same time that it's really weird how it depicts him as blonde. Now, I know that a number of you are probably going to say, Stack, why are you nitpicking hair color? Because this is Netflix, after all, and they very easily could have done to Alexander the Great what it is that they did to Cleopatra. 
Yeah, yeah, I I understand that. But if we have all of these depictions of what Alexander the Great looked like, then why not actually make him look like that in the show? The other distinct thing that we have to talk about is that what you can see here from this art that is over on the side is that Alexander the Great's eye colors are different. Alexander the Great actually had a very interesting and distinct medical condition, heterochromia, meaning that his eyes were two different colors, with one of them being blue and the other being brown, which is an exceptionally distinct feature. Like, that is one of the things that was most striking about him. So to go and change that from a long, brown-haired, maybe light brown-haired individual with multicolored eyes to an individual that has short-cropped blonde hair and piercing blue eyes just makes it seem like rather than Alexander the Great that they wanted to create a Hollywood dreamboat. And so look, I know that that is going to sound nitpicky, but for any person, any historian that is working on the show, that is something that is as easily fixed as with a singular colored contact and also maybe a little bit of hair dye. Like, that is it. You don't even have to make the hair necessarily long, but you could still have it represent that from the art. But okay, moving on. My father lies dead, and the hand of Persia is to blame. Okay, so yep, that is Darius and his queen. Boy, threaten Persia, and you won't live to try again. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Again, from the very beginning, going into this, like, I know it's just the very beginning of this trailer here, but what what, what is the combat that it is showing here? Like, yes, all right, we see Alexander, who is wearing his, you know, I mean, it's a decent helmet that it has in here, the very drab armor, but then it cuts to the actual battle that we can see here. And what is this? What is with the turban-like structures that the, uh, that the Persians are supposed to be wearing? What is with this representation of armor? You can see, you can see right here in the trailer from where it is actually flexing, which actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'm mirrored on the side, so I should be pointing this way. You can see from the way that the armor is depicted on here that it is flexing in a way that that is, that is like the thinnest kind of leather imaginable. It's all wrinkled. You can see this in here that looks cheap and awful. And it's just sword fighting. It is sword fighting. Where, where's the tactics? Where's the famous phalanx? Where's anything? It is time you know your true identity, Alexander. You are the son of Zeus. You are the son. Lead your men where Philip never could. Ah. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, there is, um... That, that's going to be a little bit of a contentious thing in here. I understand why they're talking about the making of a god for why they're titling it here. So there is this idea that Alexander depicted himself as the son of Zeus, that he wasn't actually the son of Philip, that his father was Zeus of the Greek pantheon. That is actually still something that is debated by historians, not whether or not he was, of course, not anything like that, but whether or not Alexander actually did believe that he was, that he was divine, that he was a literal demigod. What Netflix seems to be showing in here is that he did believe that, and this whole Whole thing is about him claiming his divine legacy. Persia and beyond, it is your destiny. It is your. They're really adding the in the melodrama for this. All right, cavalry. Cow. Okay. <laughs> what is? What? All right. All right. Um. Is this is this supposed to be the companion cavalry? I mean, these guys, at least in the back here, seem to kind of have some of the Boeotian helmet, sort of. I mean, they're not actually properly structured. It looks like metal caps that were just thrown onto them more than anything else. This guy right here, oh wait, he seems to have the proper helmet. Wait, why do, why won't these guys? Did the, did the costume department just not have enough of these, so they just got metal caps and threw them on afterwards? I don't know, but it, it, it looks cheap. I will say that right now, it looks cheap and he seizes the moment and takes decisive action. You underestimated Alexander. We are Persians. You, you, you wouldn't have a Netflix docudrama without some historian or individual saying something that sounds very dramatic, followed by dialogue that sounds equally, if not more, dramatic. Now here is something interesting. We're actually getting a proper shot of the Persians, at least how it is that they're being depicted. So from the very get-go, we're saying this right now, that the turban-like structures that you can see here that they're wearing for armor, like for their helmets, that, that, is, that is not accurate. That is not accurate at all. This looks like something closer to what you would see out of the Middle East a good thousand odd years later. That, that is something that is almost crusader-esque with a helmet followed by the turban that would go around. The type of headwear that was typically worn by Persian infantry, what you would have seen, is something that would have been wrapped, 
But you can see what it is that I am talking about right here. Does any of this, any of this depiction of the Persians come even close to looking like they are wearing a turban? No, it's a head wrap that went around their face, that went around their head. This is the structure of what we are talking about. Not this. No, Netflix seems to have their timeline off by a good thousand odd years at least from what it is that I am seeing with any of this equipment. Now, one of the more interesting things that it actually shows in this shot that you can see behind here is the Persian shield, what they're being utilized by these varying infantrymen in the back. The Persians actually did utilize shields that had these very interesting grooves, like they would have these little indentions on either side. That is something that when you held it up, yes, that's less protection that you have, but you very easily could put a spear or a sword, though in this case, it was more commonly a spear spear and not a sword that you'd actually be able to strike at the enemy with. It was something that it meant that you didn't have to awkwardly hold your spear above the shield or under or out to the side. You could actually go for more of a straight thrust. So they are utilizing that as well as shorter spears, but by the time that I believe Alexander was fighting the Persians, they used less of this style of shield, and it was more of the large square wicker shields that were being utilized. Yes, this is more of what I'm talking about here. The large wicker shields that would have created a kind of wall from which the archers, which were the things that did a lot of the heavy hitting of Persian forces, those would be the things behind the spear wall that would be able to actually provide damage against the enemy. The weird thing about the depictions from what we're seeing in here so far is that it's showing the Persians as more of a melee heavy force, at least from what we're seeing now with a lot of melee combat, utilizing swords instead of spears to hold position with lots of archers. Like, it's a bit of an odd thing to put here. We do not cower. We do not panic. Okay, 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 hold on, hold on. There's a depiction from the beginning. Here we go. This is a little bit more of what I'm talking about. There's the formation, again, using the kind of older shield pattern. This actually doesn't provide much protection in comparison to what we normally would have seen. This is a very heavily melee-oriented force that we are seeing with quite short spears, all things considered, and the armor, again, looks like leather. What is with the depiction and the helmets? Here is something on the Greek side, though. Okay, so we have spear formations that are being presented. This is something that looks like it's creating the... Wait, hold on. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Is that going to go down? No, 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 no. You're not going to stop at that formation and show me this here. These spears almost look like they are the same length, except slightly longer. Where's the pike formations? The thing that the, the, thing that the Macedonians were famous for in the first place, if they're being presented into battle order in formation, why are these spears not almost half again these lengths? Why are they not going out? You can already see from here that there are not going to be nearly as many spears, or pikes in this case, sarissas, that are actually going to be able to go out into the front line. I'm coming for you and your throne. All right. No, 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 no! You are not going to blindly have soldiers charge. What is this? What is this? Oh, I need to pause. I need to pause. What is this? What, 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 what is this? What is with these shorter spears? What is, what is with these guys running out here without helmets on? There's no helmets. There's no helmets on like 80% of the forces that are on the side. So, okay, we got, we got two major inaccuracies that we're seeing from the get-go in here. We're seeing a whole bunch of people charging without formation in here with shorter spears than what they should without helmets on the Macedonian side. And you are seeing Persians with leather armor, it looks like, and turbans from a thousand years in the future. Well, of course, they're running at each other in a blind melee rage, swinging swords. Wait a minute. Hold up. What is this? What is, did you, Netflix, Netflix, did you give the Persians Arabian scimitars? No, hold on. We got to watch this further and see. We got to see this further. I want to see this. All right, Alexander dressed up as Pharaoh. Yep, that did actually happen. Wait, no, no, hold on. Okay, no, no, so we, we got to go back on this. We got to go back on this from the very beginning. Um, This, this didn't happen. This makes no sense. My friends, if we go back earlier into the scene, I'm now actually seeing this where they are charging here. Oh my God, they are utilizing literal heavy scimitars. What is the, no, this is horribly inaccurate. Okay, going back into the scene, it's going to be something that confuses a number of people if they don't know history in here. When people think of the Middle East, when they think of Persia or Iran, when they think of Arabia, when they think of this kind of region, they typically think of blades being curved. But that is something that at this time was absolutely not true. That did not really start occurring until going actually into the medieval period. 
even during the Islamic conquest, we're talking about during the 700s and 800s, the weapons that were being utilized by the people of the Middle East were not primarily curved. And I say that the majority of weapons that were used were spears, but when they would use swords, these blades were straight. If you go into Google and you type in Persian sword, an image like this is likely to pop up, but no, this is something that is quite literally from over a thousand years later. The Achaemenid, the Persian swords that we were talking about, these were short swords. They were short, straight swords. These were weapons that would have been utilized as a kind of sidearm, as a last resort, as was the case for many blades in history. There were slightly curved copus swords, this being something that would have been utilized by many people across the Mediterranean in a similar style, but the majority of swords that were utilized by people were straight. That is what they did. This genuinely has to be one of the most egregious displays of historical inaccuracy that I have seen in a long time of any kind of depiction troupe. We have leather armor, of which turbans from a thousand years later, swords from a thousand years later, and on top of that, they are charging into this position. It just, it, it, it makes no sense. There's no battle tactics. There's no nothing going into this. What the hell? Alexander Immediately Christ after that, it is showing like Alexander the Great dressing up as Pharaoh. This this is true. When Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, yeah. he did yet declare he did. himself as Pharaoh. He was declared to be Pharaoh. But the crown that you can see here, what he is wearing into battle, is is this right here, the uh, the deshret. That is something that was never, ever utilized by Alexander. We have no record whatsoever of him wearing that into combat. And I suppose you could say from this that there's a representation of Alexander being the pharaoh of Egypt and then leading his forces. But there's no reason for him to actually utilize this because he didn't utilize Egyptian forces for his conquest. Alexander the Great's army was largely composed of just Greeks and Macedonians. And then as it moved further into Persia, then it started to take upon more local forces that were trained in the Greek or rather Macedonian manner. There is quite literally no reason for him to wear this crown other than Netflix going, hey, you know what would be really cool? If he was wearing the crown of Egypt. Yeah. My friends, I apologize for the abruptness of this, but just as a heads up, this section was actually copyright by Netflix. I don't know why it is that they are doing what they are doing. Maybe it's because of all the criticism that all of these docudramas are receiving, the sheer amount of melodrama that they are stirring up within it, but perhaps maybe they want to stir up more drama with creators and stop them from actually being able to express their opinions on these types of subjects. I don't know why it is, but this entire 30 second thing is them cutting this out. I apologize. Again, the crown of Egypt. All right. All right. I know that we're into the trailer. I know that that is the end of this and it released, ah, January 31st. Yeah. Yeah. Even at the time that I'm making this, they're, they're, it is going to actually be out. We're going to need to do a deep dive into the actual show that gets created and fully analyze this thing. But this, genuinely speaking, has got to be one of the worst depictions that I think that I have ever seen of ancient Persia. In no way, shape, or form is this accurate at all. This makes no sense whatsoever. It's showing Alexander's forces blindly charging into the enemy, which that's the thing about the way that the Macedonians fought. They utilized a charge with their sarissas, with their heavy spears, but they were significantly longer than what it shows on here, and simultaneously, they charged in tightly packed formations, not in a willy-nilly spread out charge of all these individual spearmen, which makes no sense and wouldn't have any of the actual punching power of the weapon if you structured it like that. The depiction of Alexander the Great wearing the crown of Egypt into battle, ridiculous, that didn't happen. The spears that they're using, and I'm saying spears because they're not, the cavalry are not utilizing pikes as they properly should. Technically speaking, yes, the polearm that the cavalry are utilizing are not going to be as long as what the infantry on the ground are wearing, but the cavalry, which, oh my God, is showing bracers, God damn. The cavalry did not utilize shields. So the way that they would hold their lances is that they would have them held in two hands for a charge to be able to steady it. You don't need need one hand for a shorter spear. It makes no sense to be holding it out like that. You are going to charge with two hands and you need two hands because it's supposed to be much longer than what it depicts. Like every woman disappointed after a third date. Still, this is not the worst historical creation that Netflix has gone and made, at least from what it is I can see in the trailer. And I know that obviously me having already talked about Cleopatra and Jinga and many of the other things that Netflix has gone and created, that that really is not saying much. I 
yes, of course, we, we all know that to be true. But just from the trailer, from what it is that I can see, the blind charges, the armor, the way that it is depicted is something that seems to inherently be filled with melodrama, something that is a hallmark trait and a major problem with Netflix docudramas, something that truly does bother me. And I'm sure that for many of you watching, it does also bother you. Still, we cannot fully judge without actually having seen the program in full. This is me watching the trailer right now. This is me giving my opinion on it from what I can see and the historical inaccuracies. But maybe, just maybe, there is actually more in the real series itself that was put out on Netflix. Even with things that were as bad as the African Queen series, there were still details in Njinga that actually did make me happy that they included, such as her trademark use of an axe, of which that was something that she was actually well trained with. So if you would like to see me do a complete breakdown of the Alexander the Great series on Netflix, then by all means, go ahead and like the video, comment, subscribe, do anything you can to help my videos in the algorithm. It really does help me, and it lets me know that you all actually want to see this kind of content from me. Thank you all very much for watching. I will see you again here next time, and goodbye, my friends.